In the name of God, the most merciful, the compassionate, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to you all. In the security conference we attended here immediately after the Iraqi government was formed in 2014, we declared our resolve to defeat ISIS Daesh and to liberate the whole of our territories and cities that have been occupied by the terrorist organization. Such area represented the third of the whole of Iraq's area. And that declaration was optimistic, and some of them, some people thought it was a fantasy. Many leaders of the world and their representatives that we've met at the time thought so. Because Iraq at the time, sadly and unfortunately, was uh, fractured, divided ethnically, and also its army was uh, fractured, as well as having a lot of uh, tension with its uh, region and the neighboring countries. In addition to uh, the decline in our uh, financial resources due to the falling international oil prices. But what we have promised, uh, we exactly achieved. We have defeated Daesh and ISIS, and we have uh, returned a lot of people to their homes and liberated cities, uniting the country and ending the caliphate. And we killed their uh, senior leadership that have tortured citizens and uh, uh, imposed unjust uh, uh, judgments on women and children, as well as breaking down a lot of antiquities and many, many things that have witnessed the Mesopotamian civilization. In addition to this, uh, we have uh, done a lot of reforms uh, and a lot of remedies, as well as a societal reconciliation and an open door policy, which uh, in the whole uh, uh, turned this defeat into a victory and brought stability and put uh, Iraq on the right path. Uh, we have managed to unite people, and thanks be to God, we have the people standing by our side, and the security forces have dealt uh, very well with the people and helped our people. We have united the Iraqi people with all its factions, uh, be they Arabs, Kurds, Sunni, Shiites, Christians, Azidis, and all the other uh, sects and ethnicities. Iraq came out united after having been at the brink of being divided. We were able to exercise the federal authority on all the Iraqi territories according to all the powers vested in us and according to the Constitution. The unity of our nation, our country, became a success parallel to that success over Daesh. The Iraqi uh, army fought alongside the per Kurdish Peshmerga together for the first time in the history of Iraq, uh, when in the past they used to fight one another in the era of the dictatorship. Uh, Iraqis have given a lot of their precious blood. They were the ones who killed and were fighting on the grind. They have proved to be very brave. We owe them a lot for this victory. We owe them for their sacrifices by giving martyrs and uh, all those injuries from the army, the police, the popular mobilization forces, the tribal forces, and as well as the Peshmerga and the security forces. Iraq has witnessed one of the largest voluntary defense campaign that has been called by the religious authority, uh, Sayyid Ali Sistani, in our, our foreign policy, we have managed and succeeded in gaining backing and support. And we are very keen to bolster this uh, contacts or relationship with our neighbors uh, on the basis of respecting national sovereignty and mutual interest without intervening in internal affairs and uh, holding on to the independence of our national decisions based 
on the guarantee of the interest of our people and our country, safeguarding our rights, wealth, and liberties. Ladies and gentlemen, ISIS, the terrorist organization, is very close to our borders on the other side of Syria, our neighboring country. We call upon the unity of the states of the world to uh, mobilize their efforts in order to fight terrorism and uh, to pursue all its uh, sleeping cells. We think that this uh, terrorist organization is extremely dangerous. And we have not allowed it to keep one single uh, acre of the land of our Iraq. We have to do away and uh, uh, also put an end to all the cells that exist in other countries. It is time to put an end to this terrorist organization. As we have said a few years ago, we shall uh, defeat terrorism. We shall all be able to do this in the whole of our area through cooperation. And let me tell you that this uh, terrorist ideology does not represent Islam because it caused the death of many, many Muslims in our Arab area, much, much more than those who have been killed elsewhere around the world. We are also stand in solidarity, standing in solidarity with the families and, uh, and the victims of terrorism. The challenge we face today is to bring back stability to our country. And that requires a lot of efforts and a lot of capabilities in, t in order to bring back the basic services in terms of education and uh, all the services that are fit for human beings. And we also appreciate the stand uh, uh, that was witnessed by the international community. And we also saw this uh, by uh, what happened in Kuwait a few days ago in the conference for the reconstruction of Iraq. We were able also to see a glimmer of hope uh, that many uh, Iraqis were able to see that what has been destroyed by terrorism can be rebuilt we can now give the area and the world a bright future and a bright vision of what can happen after areas are cleared from terrorism. And we could also give hope to our people and citizens. The other challenge that faces us is to exercise the authority of the state and also to put an end to all uh, armed uh, uh, factions in the country, and also uh, to increase the capacity of our intelligence forces and to bring about peace and stability to our people in the country and uh, bring about uh, the environment that is fit for a development, uh, reinvestment, uh, and uh, reconstruction in Iraq in order to uh, give a good uh, uh, life for all our citizens. We are also working uh, through our intelligence apparatus in order to pursue all the remnants of Daesh who are taking every opportunity to attack our innocent citizens and also to try and to do away with this culture of ISIS and uh, to liberate the societies that were under uh, the control of uh, ISIS as well. It is very important to uh, say that we have to warn all countries uh, against uh, the spread of uh, uh, terrorism. We have to stand united, and we shall do our utmost in uh, this uh, respect. We must not allow the incubators of terrorism to continue and to grow. No matter how many or how few they are, they do exploit all those societies where their freedom and liberties prevail in order to launch attacks against innocent uh, people, be it anywhere in the world in uh, a lot of the capitals of the world. From our vision that Security is indivisible. We are calling upon taking serious steps to put an end to the wars that are exhausting 
our people in the area, and we uh, promote dialogue as the only means to resolve internal disputes. We also have to put an end to all these uh, repercussions in our area and the dangers that bring about uh, fractures, uh, and those fractures allow terrorism to uh, appear. We also see that the post daesh era, we have to uh, create uh, a network of economic relationships, uh, mutual interest, and also to rely on the capacity of, chill, uh, of uh, youth in order to prevent uh, terrorism from getting at them and recruiting them. We also see that this is all going to serve the, uh, our interest, and to, we will be able to work uh, together without isolation, because this is a very important not to work against one another. This only leads to more disputes. And as uh, we have seen from circumstances that uh, uh, security is indivisible, we have to look at prosperity. Uh, prosperity cannot be achieved in our area without us all standing together. Otherwise, all our efforts will be hampered. All the efforts in order to bring back prosperity will be hampered. We look forward to a continual cooperation with the countries of uh, the world, our friendly countries that have stood by us and supported us in our war against terrorism. Uh, and we hope that this cooperation will continue in the phase of peace, reconstruction, and rebuilding, and to continue working together for a better future for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. You have the world's uh, congratulations and also thanks. Uh, I want to now call to the uh, podium the Pakistani Chief of Army Staff, uh, General uh, Kamar Javed uh, Bajwa. Uh, he is commanding a key front in the battle against violent extremism. He also uh, has a complicated relationship uh, with the United States. Um, uh, I would note uh, for this audience that the New York Times recently quoted a leading uh, Pakistani opposition politician, Imran Khan, saying, and I'm quoting from the New York Times, never has an army chief been so openly supporting democracy. So let's welcome General Bajwa. Is it possible to raise it a little bit? I think it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Please, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and good evening. It's my proud privilege today to be addressing this August gathering on a subject of critical importance to all of us. Let me first offer my sincere thanks and gratitude for this opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, I make no pretense about my intellectual credentials. But may I humbly say that I have the honor of commanding an army which has achieved great successes against violent extremism and terrorism, of course, at a huge cost and sacrifice. My perspective would therefore be that of a soldier and not that of an intellectual or a politician. Let me say from the outset that the present jihadism is a misnomer. Jihad is a highly evolved concept that underlines myriad struggle against tyranny of all types. Muslims are taught that control of self is the most elevated form of jihad. There's also saying of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that the best of jihad is a word of truth in the face of a tyrant ruler. On the other hand, Qatal, an aspect of armed jihad, 
comes at the lowest end of the spectrum of actions and beliefs that comprise the concept of jihad and can only be sanctioned by a state authority and nobody else. However, there is no denying the fact that the powerful concept such as jihad can be easily misused for propagating extremism and terrorism, particularly as many Muslims world over are not only feeling alienated, but disowned, targeted, and devoid of positive expression. Same is true for the concept of caliphate, which is more of a nostalgic response rather than the actual possibility for most Muslims. Ladies and gentlemen, in Pakistan, the notion of caliphate has not found any traction. But jihad has definitely been used to radicalize fairly large tract of population. However, this, phenomena, this phenomenon is not a recent creation or started after 9-11. The Frankenstein was actually created by the liberal free world with a willing but myopic cooperation from our side after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. There are, therefore, we all are responsible for making the world population in general and the Muslim population in particular hostage to this extremist ideology. Times have surely changed since the noon of March 10, 1982, when President Ronald Reagan dedicated the March 22nd launch of Columbia Space Shuttle to the valiant Afghan Mujahideens or Jihadis and termed their struggle against the Soviet occupation forces as a representation of the man's highest aspiration for freedom. When I was young, Pakistan was a normal country as any other country in the world. Jacqueline Kelly flew to Karachi. The Beatles visited us. Queen Elizabeth went to the Khyber Pass to chat with the tribesmen. We were a favorite tourism destination for many. We were hosting World Cups of hockey and cricket, besides many other multinational events. World Bank turned Pakistan in 1963 as one of the most progressive and dynamic developing countries in Asia. The 70s were nothing less than a disaster for us, but even the separation of eastern part of our country and the political upheavals thereafter did not change the society as deeply as the event of 1979, the year the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and the Iranian Revolution happened the next door. It was only then that we started learning that we were not only Muslims, but Sunnis and Shias. It was also the time that we were drawn to conviction of fighting Soviet invasion and also challenging communist ideology with another ideology. With the able intellectual assistance of the free world, a syllabus was designed in one of the Western universities for madrasas, wherein jihad was fed to young minds in a concentrated dose without context or explanation. An exception was created using a self-defense clause to justify declaration of jihad by non-state actors. Young men were recruited from all over the world, radicalized, and then left and disowned after they had delivered us the success. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for a long lesson on history. But while it is a history for you, it is still very much a live issue for us back home as a fairly large number of people are radicalized, armed, and empowered politically and ideologically. They cannot be wished away just because we don't like them anymore. Please note, we are harvesting what we sowed 40 years back. So it will be a while before this scourge is eliminated in totality. But first, let us stop calling it jihadism, as it is nothing else but terrorism. With this rather long context, let me now come to the story of Pakistan's struggle against extremism, terrorism, and so-called jihadism. Pakistan Army has waged a relentless and bloody fight against terrorism and violence, violent extremism at a mon monumental human and material cost. Over 35,000 Pakistanis have lost their lives. Over 48,000 are critically wounded or disabled. Financial cost exceeds US $250 billion, only a fraction of which is actually shared by our global partners. Today, I can say with pride and conviction that there are no organized camps on our side of the border. However, presence of terrorists of various hues and colors cannot be ruled out. We still have their active and, and sleeper cells who are hiding in mountains, border towns, 
and 54 refugees camps besides some major towns and cities. For your information, of the last 130 terrorist attack in our border areas last year, 123 were conceived, planned, and executed from Afghanistan. We understand their predicament, therefore we do not blame them. But instability in Afghanistan is also hurting us badly, and it is happening despite the presence of the most powerful alliance in Kabul. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, Afghanistan's success of 2003 was lost when resources were pulled out prematurely for war in Iraq. Today, after spending more than 1.4 trillion, the situation can best be described as a stalemate. But to my reckoning, the cause of stalemate is not Haqqani Network or TTA, tariq -e taliban Afghanistan, as they had been almost been defeated 13 years ago. It was the pursuit of a wrong strategy which led to their resurrection. Let me say that the popular assertion of TTA not being defeated in totality due to presence of part of their leadership in Pakistan is not correct or whole truth. We defeated Al-Qaeda, tariq -e taliban Pakistan, and jamaat ul ahrar while their safe havens still exist in Afghanistan at a mere fraction of resources employed on the other side of the border. Now, instead of blame game, it is time for NATO and allies to uh, conduct an audit and introspection to find out, find out the causes of this stalemate. Ladies and gentlemen, in our war against terror, military operations were not the only thing that we were conducted. We realized very early that the complex problem of violent extremism could not be handled through military operations only. First and foremost, we generated public opinion to defeat the terrorist narrative. We also formulated the National Action Plan aimed at fighting terrorism and gradually rooting out extremism. We launched Operation Radul Fasad, eradication of the tumult in 2017 with the aim of firstly targeted kinetic and enhanced law enforcement operations to locate and destroy the residual terrorist presence across the country. Second prong of our campaign comprises supporting the National Action pl uh, Plan that involves better prosecution, policing, education reforms, along with curbing terrorist financing and hate speech. Equally, impo equally important is our information prong aimed at discrediting the terrorist ideology, including the misuse of terms like jihad and caliphate. Most recently, 1,854 eminent Pakistani religious scholars representing all schools of thought within Islam teamed up to issue a resounding fatwa against violence, extremism, and terrorism in the name of religion. Called the message of Pakistan, it bans suicide bombing and jihad other than the one sanctioned by the state. Ladies and gentlemen, our successes have been made possible by the collective resolve of our entire nation. However, however, we are far from done. It is my sincere belief that Pakistan's lasting domestic peace hinges on peace and stability in Afghanistan. Therefore, despite our limited resources, we are trying our best to export peace to our, neighboring, to our neighbors in the West. Please remember, at times our efforts are curtailed by capacity and not by will. Pakistan and Afghan, Afghanistan are sovereign countries. Both countries have a right to peace and progress. However, this will only be possible if our respective soils are not used against each other. In this regard, two aspects are important. Firstly, we still have nearly 2.7 million Afghan refugees in our country, whose concentration are routinely used by TTA and Haqqani Network to recruit, morph, and melt. It is time for these refugees to be repatriated, repatriated with dignity. It is the only way we can ensure that no one is misusing our hospitality and soil for mischief in Afghanistan. This is possible at a fraction of the cost of war in Afghanistan, which is currently around $46 billion per year. Secondly, our borders with Afghanistan is highly porous. We have unilaterally taken many steps to ensure proper management of this border. We have raised tens of new border-specific units, built hundreds of new border surveillance post, and have now started the process of fencing 2,300 kilometers of the border. 
we are putting scanners and biometrics at the border terminal, terminals to ensure that while common aghwans are facilitated, miscreants and terrorists are prevented or arrested. Furthermore, we are fully committed to the international consensus that political reconciliation is the only solution to Afghan issue. <clears throat> While we are actively supporting the new U.S. study in the region, based primarily on kinetic approach, we are not leaving any stone unturned to try and do our best in bringing the parties of the conflict to the negotiating table. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the seeming frustration, very few countries have achieved as much that we have in our war against terror, with over 1,100 Al-Qaeda operative killed and other 600 handed over to U.S., Pakistan is instrumental in disruption and decimation of Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan and Pakistan. But the struggle continues as the threat is morphing. Intelligence agencies of multiple countries have confirmed the ongoing re relocation of fleeing Daesh fighters to Afghanistan. Being worse hit by perennial instability in Afghanistan, Pakistan has legitimate concern about its new threat, joining the roster of over 20 terrorist outfits. So far, we have been successful in denying any foothold to Daesh in Pakistan, but we are very concerned about its unchecked growth in the neighborhood. We need to counter the threat much more proactively through collaboration and cooperation. The war against terrorism extremism will take some time before the world is free of it. Therefore, we all have to be patient and remain steadfast. We need to first counter terrorist narrative with a superior narrative before breaking their back. Unfortunately, we have not done enough in this regard. Finally, trust, cooperation, and sharing will work, and scapegoating won't. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, let me say that the terrorists thrive on our division and feed on our inability to come together against them. I humbly call upon all of you to deny them these chinks in our collective armor. Please realize that it's a global problem and needs a global approach. Lack of focus and commitment and individual efforts won't take us anywhere. I thank you. Thank you, uh, General Bajwa, for very clear and, and direct comments. Um, for which we're all grateful. I want to now ask the members of the panel uh, on jihadism after the caliphate to come on stage. I'll introduce you as you're walking uh, on stage. Uh, your seats are marked with little cards. Uh, first, Thomas de, de Mazier, who is uh, the Federal Minister of the Interior here in Germany. Dan Coates, who is the Director of National Intelligence, runs the U.S. intelligence community, and as people know, former ambassador to, to Germany. Uh, Sami Shukri, who is the Foreign Minister of Egypt and a, an old friend of mine for many years. Hermes Janawi, who is the Foreign Minister of Tunisia. Major General Retired Babagan Manguno, who is the National Security Advisor of Nigeria. And Sir Julian King, who is the EU Security Commissioner, dubbed in the press the Security Czar of the EU. Uh, welcome to all the panelists. Let me just set the scene briefly. Um, by describing where I was a week ago. I traveled to Syria with our Special Operations Forces and spent four days there looking at the subject that we're going to discuss tonight. So uh, in Raqqa, in the ruins of Raqqa, the capital of the caliphate, I saw the face of defeat. It's powerful, it's disturbing, but it shows just how much effort has been put into this fight by the, the coalition. Traveling to Shaddadi in the east, looking out at the remaining front where Al-Qaeda fighters, including people think Baghdadi, their leader, are on the run in the desert, you realize that there remain small pockets, people who are still at large, other people who are slipping out uh, into regime areas, maybe heading into Turkey, maybe heading uh, to Europe. And finally, visiting Manbij, where uh, across the lines a mile and a half away are Turkish-supported uh, militias, you realize just how complicated this post-ISIS uh, Syria is going to be. So I came away from that trip um, thinking that 
what I'd most like to hear from this panel of experts is uh, first, is this adversary, as its caliphate is destroyed, in, in what way would you say it's been defeated? And in what ways do you worry that the threat uh, of jihad that, that uh, ISIS represented will continue as a, as a virtual uh, caliphate online, inspiring what we call lone wolf actors, uh, perhaps in individuals uh, who have been in this uh, cockpit of Raqqa and have escaped and are now uh, moving toward targets where they could do enormous damage. Uh, so the, the, if you could give us, each of you, from your perspective, from your front in this war, uh, your assessment of, of, of where we are. Let me start with uh, Minister de Mazier. Uh, for Germany and for all of Europe, uh, the paradox is that this fight in Syria and Iraq against the Islamic State ended up being radically destabilizing for Europe, uh, in part because of concern about immigration, <clears throat> in part because of internal uh, political uh, arguments. So let, let me ask <coughs> the minister to speak first about the strict security issue. Do you know uh, what's coming at you? Are you monitoring people as they move through Turkey, perhaps toward Europe. And second, if you could just speak a little bit about the issue that's vexed you and your chancellor, the issue of immigration. Uh, you've got an agreement among your coalition, I gather, for quotas, but in the rest of the EU, there, uh, the idea of, of quotas for refugee immigration is still very controversial in, in some countries. So could you address those two uh, to get us started? Yeah, uh, um, I would like to uh give at least my first remark. Ja, ich möchte zu mindestens meine I can switch in English. Um, ich will gerne auf Ihre uh, Fragen I'm happy to answer your questions. Let me start as follows. The so-called Islamic State is almost beaten militarily, but what does that mean for us? First of all, the attractiveness of the so-called IS has increased in Europe along with its military successes, as long as it was military successful. The attractiveness of its website uh, was great, and we had a hard time developing counter-narratives that were convincing. Now, one might think, now that IS is militarily beaten, they will all come back and all is fine. Unfortunately, that is not the case. It's quite interesting to note that few people have returned. So far, we have seen little by way of foreign fighters going to other regions, to Afghanistan, to Libya, to Yemen. At least there aren't many of them that can change, of course, but that's what the situation is as pre at present. Those who do return are either well-trained terrorist attackers or they are frustrated and never again want anything to do with ISIL or something in between. So we must be prepared for that. There may be foreign fighters coming back, but so far it's not the case, not in large numbers anyway. So my second remark, when you look at the type of, con of terror attacks conducted in Europe, we have to say that the last major def uh, attack took place two years ago in March 2016, and I'm talking about la major coordinated attacks using explosives. The attacks we had afterwards were, of course, very hard on the victims, but they are, were rather primitive as far as the implementation was concerned. They used knives, they used uh, motor vehicles. They were not complex, requiring a lot of preparation. What does that mean? It could be that ISIL's ca capacity to control and plan major attacks has decreased. That would be good news, but we're not, we're not sure. We assume that there will be complex attacks, and they are in preparation. 
but their lack of ability to coordinate such major attacks may mean that individuals may feel encouraged to carry out their own attacks without being encouraged by the organization. And these will be simple attacks. Very often, these are not foreign fighters. These are people who have lived in our countries and have been here for a long time. My third remark, and you may be surprised to hear that from an um, interior minister. Interior ministers are often skeptical when it comes to prevention. They often say these are soft skills. That's not the real thing. But I have never seen any of my fellow interior ministers talk so much about preventive measures at the European level. We know that it's not possible to win the battle by mere repressive measures. It has to do with early recognition. It has to do with preventing radicalization back in our own countries. And it has to do with resolving international conflicts, which is the subject of this conference. It also has to do with the fact we need to try and limit the breeding ground for ISIL, and that is poverty, bad governance, the fight between Shiites and Sunnis, of course, the Middle East conflict, the economic dominance of the West. All these are reasons that may lead to young people being radicalized. That is not an explanation or even less a justification of terror, but it is a task for us. It means we need to work preventively as well, apart from other measures we take. So what do we need to do? Sir Julian King, I think, will talk about that in a minute. In the last three or four years, we've done a lot when it comes to fighting terrorism, more than in the 20 years before that. Some things still need to be implemented, but a lot has been decided. Entry exit system, uh, passenger data, early warning system, the Schengen information system, all of that is immensely important. But the most important thing is we know that knowledge is power, so the most important thing is interoperability. We need to pool all the data we have and to work together. Also, the different services, cooperation with the United States and other reliable partners in the region. That is decisive when it comes to our security back at home. Now, my last point, you mentioned migration. When the major migration wave hit our countries in 2015 and 16, the security agencies said, well, there are probably not many refugees amongst them. They don't want to be registered. So terrorists won't be hiding among the refugees because they are looking for different ways of coming to Europe. But that was a misconception because terrorists have come, they have conducted attacks, and sometimes they've laid false trails in order to uh, create a link with the refugee movement. So that is true. There have been terrorists hiding amongst the refugees, but there were other refugees who came as real refugees and became radicalized after they'd come. So it's not just one simple explanation. And it means we must not be naive. But on the other hand, we must not suspect all refugees of being potential attackers. We need to understand that we will not defeat terrorism anytime soon, and there is not one single type of attacks. We must also accept there can't be either homegrown terrorism or foreign fighters. It's both of them. It's not no migration or only migrants. It's something in between. We need to be patient, and we need a mix between preventive and repressive measures. To Director Coates, I want to just ask a, a brief follow-up question, which is the political tension that's inherent in your discussion of prevention. On the one hand, prevention means being able to work with Muslim communities to get information from them, to cooperate with them in dealing with people who are become, becoming radical. For, for some people, prevention means reducing the flow of, of migrants. 
And the rhetoric from the people who say the way to prevent this problem is to stop people from coming in makes the first job harder because often these Muslim communities feel threatened. And I wonder how you as minister uh, see yourself uh, and your government balancing those two. Nein, beides ist richtig. Uh, die They're both true. Radicalization, that's quite an interesting phenomenon. Early on, we thought that radicalization takes place via the internet. That was wrong. Radicalization starts with human beings. It starts with people. The internet is something that accelerates radicalization, but it's not the means. It's not the, way, the thing that causes radicalization. So it's always people. And the same is true in Germany. Strengthening a liberal type of Islam is just as important as fighting radicalized Muslims living in our country, Salafists and other groups. So again, we need a mix of both measures, repression and prevention. As to the number of refugees, it is necessary to reduce that anyway, not just because of the terrorist threat. That goes too far, of course, to discuss that here. But of course, it is not OK if the decision whether you go to Europe or not is taken by people smugglers. That's an inhumane way of dealing with it. So those who can afford it will be most likely to come. That is not OK. Of course, we must stop illegal migration. And legal migration must be governed by certain criteria. But in all cases, you need a certain way of uh, checking the people who come in as early as possible. So when it comes to resettlement, you need to check the, back the background of the people who come. And again, you need interoperability to do that and an entry exit system at the external borders means we want to know who comes to, to, to Europe and anyone who comes to Europe or leaves Europe will be registered. That has almost been decided at the political level. It's a complicated IT project, so we'll need two or three years to implement that. But that may be one of the major benefits in terms of security. And once the people are here, we need to check them as well. We need other background checks. The problem is that we have no reference data. We do have data about people who turned criminal in Germany, but we don't have any data about people who have not turned criminal yet. So the uh, people who pose a potential terrorist risk are not known to us yet. They're not contained in any file. So the idea that you close the border and thus achieve maximum security is not true because we have many people who are in our countries right now and have become radicalized. There is a link between migration and the terrorist threat, but it's not true to say the same thing vice versa. If there were no migration, there'd be no terrorist threat. That is not true. I think answer. Let me turn now to uh, Director uh, Coates, who is the head of the uh, U.S. intelligence community, the many agencies that uh, monitor uh, counterterrorism. Um, and Director Coates, you're uniquely placed to give this audience uh, a kind of global uh, threat assessment. Uh, U.S. intelligence has the ability to, to look uh, every place. And I, I think this audience would be especially curious about uh, the extent to which you think ISIS really is beaten in Syria and Iraq, whether this is just a mop-up, and whether you worry that as, as some people escape and go to other safe havens in, in Yemen, in North Africa, in Afghanistan, they will be able to reconstitute the kind of threat that has been so dangerous. Well, I think that's the operative uh, question, uh, whether or not we have done enough to keep ISIS uh, from reconstituting, or whether we're just at a moment of pause uh, while they reconstitute. We have uh, driven a stake in the heart of ISIS. We've taken, we've undone the caliphate. Uh, we've taken back 
virtually all of the territory with some remnants, which were uh, mentioned uh, uh, earlier. But we have also, uh, it's like killing an octopus. Uh, we've driven a knife into its heart, but the tentacles have spread. We saw significant evidence of that in the South Philippines uh, with fairly extraordinary uh, military actions needed to uh, defeat that tentacle. Uh, we have heard reports uh, throughout Indonesia, Malaysia, other uh, uh, eastern uh, countries uh, of the concern about the potential formation and, and uh, continued uh, threat uh, that they feel. Uh, we have uh, seen ISIS uh, try to reconstitute in ungoverned land in Libya. Uh, we had some success in uh, disrupting uh, that event. Uh, but our assessment is that ISIS um, uh, is a longer term issue for uh, the world's nations uh, to, uh, to address. Uh, I just delivered the uh, annual threat assessment uh, last Tuesday to uh, our Congress, uh, both in classified and unclassified measures um, separated from the two, uh, and also to the American public. Uh, prominent in that assessment uh, was the, the uh, uh, terror uh, uh, provisions, uh, and we uh, continued to assess that ISIS will remain a uh, threat partly because um, it's more than just um, a terrorist organization. It is uh, an ideology and perhaps a theology. And the combination of ideology and theology, I think, outlasts defeats on the battlefield, reaches out to disparate groups around the globe uh, who have bought into uh, this perversion, I think, of, of the interpretation of the Quran, uh, the, the prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. Uh, when you're dealing with something like that, I think you're dealing with something much longer than uh, simply a, a period of time in which terrorism uh, uh, prevails. And I don't believe that, uh, I think that then puts us in a situation where we have to do uh, what we had to do in America after 9-11, uh, and that is, uh, and I see that Jane Harmon here is in the audience when she was uh, instrumental in putting together on a bipartisan basis uh, the formation of the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And the purpose of that was to integrate all of our intelligence uh, so that we could have a full picture. Think of a puzzle with pieces on the table and uh, we're trying to put that together. We have, uh, as uh, David uh, mentioned, 16 agencies plus the ODNI. Uh, those 16s all contribute pieces of that puzzle in order to put the full picture together. And those pieces are collected in various ways through different agencies and entities, but they are brought together to give us the full picture. I think that process has put us in a position to better stem uh, the threat uh, to the United States. But I think what it also says is that other countries, uh, Europe uh, and countries throughout the uh, nations throughout the world, uh, need to think about how they can integrate their intelligence sources uh, in a way that they can see the picture. And then taking that information that's gathered, both within a nation state but also sharing it among the agencies, but sharing it among the nation states that want to deal and need to deal uh, with this particular issue. And so we uh, think partnership engagement is important to us. And we look at it from different ways. We have allies, of course, that uh, we work together with closely. We have others that perhaps uh, don't fall in that same circle of of trust, but we want to work with and we want to build those relationships, especially on counterterrorism. There may be issues in terms of sharing uh, intelligence information um, with uh, certain uh, allies or uh, adversaries, but certainly we can agree that on the issue of counterterrorism, it is a foundational process which we all have to uh, engage in 
and even so with some of our adversaries. Um, the idea is that the leadership of these various nations, whether they're our close allies or whether they're, even if they're adversaries, uh, they want to keep their people safe. And the best way to keep their people safe is not only to have an interior process in place with all the uh, uh, collection of intelligence and organizations and working down through federal, state, and local, and local police, and all that goes into that process, but also receiving information about threats that may be coming that have been determined by uh, other nations. And so um, it's no secret that uh, the United States is reaching out uh, to uh, nation states that both allies and adversaries. Uh, the incident uh, in St. Petersburg, which was uh, uh, collected and analyzed and assessed by the United States and passed on to Russian leadership uh, prevented a uh, potential horrendous uh, attack at which uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, uh, gave thanks to the United States for providing this warning. Uh, we pro provided a response to that saying we hope there's reciprocity, uh, that if you see something uh, coming our way uh, that you would pick up the telephone and let us know or send us signals by, to let us know uh, that it's coming and, and help us prevent that. I think that can be a foundation for uh, inter-nation uh, relationships in terms of dealing with this. Now, regarding the, the uh, uh, situation here, if what I've said is true, that this is going to be an ideological, theological, uh, attractive uh, 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 ISIS that is now dispersed, or AQ, which may now reconstitute, thinking, oh, next up. Uh, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, others, uh, terrorist groups exist, and uh, they do not look at the defeat of ISIS as a, as a means of deconstructing uh, their organizations. They see, they're seeing this as an opportunity for them to step up, and so I think that has to be uh, brought into, into play here as we, uh, as we examine this. But uh, it's going to require then, if it is a long-term issue that we have to deal with, it uh, means that uh, resolve and resilience has to be part of our, of our strategy. Because if we're in this for the long term, uh, we have to uh, advise our public of that, maintain our defenses, continue our information sharing, and be prepared to stay with this and, and understand that we're in for a long haul. In defeating, the, in defeating an ideology and in, in defeating a theocracy, um, uh, the, you can't send a Presbyterian, Christian, or a Catholic uh, over to the Muslim community and say, you're making a wrong interpretation of the Quran. Uh, that has to come from within Muslim nations, within Arab nations. It has to come from their scholars. It has to come from their imams. And it has to come from their people, who, as we saw in defeating uh, communism uh, through the 80s, elect Valesa, but the people of the country stood up and said, enough. We are not going to tolerate this barbarism any longer. We are not going to see our fellow Muslims and Arabs slaughtered and beheaded. We, do, we are not going to see the destruction of our beliefs, the, 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 the formation of a theology, a radical Islamic uh, the, uh, theology, uh, that is, is fulfilling uh, the prophecy uh, of, the, of the Quran. Uh, it needs to be an all-nation effort by everyone from its leaders to its important scholars, uh, to its imams, and to the people who will say, enough, you may kill me, but I will not stand for this. We will not stand for this. We will overflow the center we will pour millions of people into the street and stand up and say, enough. And I think that's the only assessment that at least I'm thinking about in terms of how we address this issue. Mr. Director, I want to come back to you in a second round and ask you a question that's not exactly about counterterrorism but is on our minds. But I'm going to finish with our panel and then come back. I want to ask Foreign Minister Shukri. You in Egypt face a particularly uh, toxic and difficult uh, spin-off of 
core ISIS. As the caliphate has been taken down, your fight in the Sinai looks as, looks as tough as ever. And I think we'd all be interested in hearing a report on how that's going and just more broadly how you, uh, President Sisi, uh, all the authorities in Egypt are, are looking at this fight now. Well, thank you, David. Uh, certainly, I have a lot to agree with in, in what has been uh, said by both uh, Prime Minister Abadi and the Pakistani Chief of Staff and, and my colleagues on, on the panel. Uh, what Egypt has been facing certainly has, uh, has brought uh, damage to our security forces, uh, loss of life, uh, innocent civilians, and uh, we have uh, uh, been uh, at the forefront of the fight against terrorism. But uh, let me say that uh, neither is ISIS uh, uh, unique to uh, terrorist ideology and theology, nor is uh, it anything related to jihadism uh, as purely interpreted in Islam or uh, the concept of khal the caliphate. We all know that these are convoluted recruitment tools to uh, primarily deal with a political ambition, a political ambition that took root because of the conditions in uh, the Middle East after 2011 and, and found uh, sufficient justification and unfortunately some acquiescence on the part of many of our friends who deemed that the utilization, uh, as was in the 80s, of some certain elements of uh, rad radical uh, and uh, terrorist organizations as a, a convenient uh, tool to advance uh, a political objective. Uh, and here, I think we have to be uh, as frank and as candid as possible if we are to seriously address uh, what is probably going to be a generational issue to totally uh, dismantle the terrorist networks and to uh, address it in a comprehensive manner where it is not only ISIS. We have seen a uh, uh, number of uh, affiliated groups that have, have uh, declared their allegiance on the basis of the successes that uh, ISIS has achieved in Iraq and, and Syria and the uh, promulgation of the uh, radicalization through social media and the, the general uh, success and, and uh, attract attractiveness uh, to certain people uh, who, who deem this uh, a way of life. Uh, so it's, we have to deal with ISIS, but we have to deal with the Nusra, and we have to deal with uh, Ahrar al-Sham, and we have to deal with uh, Boko Haram and Shabab and uh, Ansar Bet al-Maqdis, or, or whatever they're called, because it is fundamentally an ideology, an ideology uh, for the purpose of uh, homogeny, for the purpose of, of uh, gaining political ground. Uh, and uh, if we don't deal with it from that perspective, then we will only be uh, putting out fires in one place to find it uh, reigniting in another. But we have to also direct ourselves to the issue of uh, consistency, consistency of uh, the international community's application of counterterrorism measures. And it bewilders us when certain members of the European Union advocate for the lifting of terrorist organizations from the uh, European Union terrorist list. On what basis? Terrorist organizations that have been uh, uh, well documented to have uh, perpetrated terrorist activity and who continue to do so. Uh, here again, the issue of uh, allowing for the network of financing to expand and not addressing that uh, seriously is, is another issue. The issue of uh, state sponsors, uh, either directly or inadvertently, of terrorist organizations is, is another worrying factor. You mentioned the Riqa, and we all haven't had any uh, sufficient explanation as to the departure of a number of uh, foreign fighters uh, very comfortably from Riqa, passing through international borders and winding up uh, either in the Sinai or in Libya or in uh, Somalia or in Yemen, for that matter. So these are questions that need to be answered, need to be answered directly uh, so that we can raise the level of our confidence that we are all on the same page and we are all working to achieve uh, the same goals, uh, but uh, dealing with the ideological uh, uh, dilemma is certainly our responsibilities as Arabs, as Muslims, our ability to uh, push back and to present the, the correct religious narrative, and we are utilizing in Egypt that through al uh, and uh, other uh, religious institutions, as others are, as well as the programs within the coalition that uh, reach out and utilize the various aspects of social uh, 
the media to expand that, uh, that narrative and to protect the youth, prim primarily the youth from, uh, from whatever uh, attractiveness there might be, uh, whether in convoluting the, the religious uh, uh, narrative or through uh, this promotion of a lifestyle uh, of uh, adventurism or, uh, and such. Uh, we, we hope that all of this will, will bear fruit, but it is our consensus on what we are dealing with and, and aspects related to, to why have we suddenly called terrorism uh, uh, violent extremism? Is that a justification for nonviolent extremism? Extremism <laughs> is extremism, and it will t tend to utilize violence at one point or another, depending on <laughs> its tactical objectives and how to obtain them. So uh, let us call a spade a spade and not get into the uh, definitions of terminology that will put us on different uh, perspectives and, and interpretations of what we are fighting so that we know what we are fighting, we address it, and we deal with all of the various aspects in a comprehensive manner. Egypt is currently undertaking a, uh, a campaign to uh, rid the Sinai of uh, the infiltration of uh, foreign fighters, of uh, e Egyptians who have been lulled into uh, uh, the jihadist uh, mentality uh, and, and been seduced to, to this violent uh, criminal activity. And of course, after the, the slaughter, the, the massacre, the inhumanity of the uh, killing of 300 plus uh, worshippers in the mosque, it became intolerable for the Egyptian public to continue to bear the, the heavy loss of life of civilians, innocent women, um, children, and men uh, during worship. It, it was appalling, it was barbaric, and uh, we had to undertake uh, uh, this extensive campaign. The campaign uh, was, uh, has been well planned. Uh, it will be ongoing until we are confident that we have eradicated uh, the elements. Let me just tell you that in the last uh, seven days, we have discovered uh, 50 caches of weaponry and, and explosives. Uh, and we have uh, discovered in one location 1,500 kilo kilograms of C4. And for many of you here, you can recognize the damage that could be done by a small, small quantity of C4 as an explosive, uh, so you imagine the dedication and the commitment, but also the resources available, and you know how the expense, uh, not to mention the, uh, the, the networks that uh, might, must be associated with the uh, trafficking in uh, materials, uh, and, and to have such a large amount of explosives, uh, whether financed or, or trans transported, and uh, becoming available to these elements is a very dangerous uh, uh, development. Minister, just a brief uh, follow-up. It's, it's an important uh, factual point. Uh, news reports say that this threat in, in Sinai is so serious that Egypt has cooperated with Israel and that Israel has undertaken air activities over S Sinai, various activities. Uh, in, in cooperation with, 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 with Egypt to try to get at a, a problem that threatens Israel as well as Egypt. Uh, could you comment on that? Well, well, I can say that we are open to cooperate in terms of exchange of information and, and uh, uh, intelligence, and, and this is a point that I should have raised even earlier, that this is one of the very crucial aspects of the degree of the international community's cooperation and exchange of information is vital. Uh, but we are uh, confident in the abilities that we uh, have in the armed forces and the uh, uh, police force and their ability to uh, eradicate the uh, presence of those uh, that are operating in Sinai. We have uh, expanded a, a time where we did not want to uh, uh, create a, a conditions of collateral damage to the uh, Egyptian population in the Sinai, but I think that the current uh, uh, campaign and its effectiveness so far and its results uh, is a demonstration of the abilities that we have and that we will utilize. And any uh, exchange of information and assistance is uh, very welcome from all quarters. And uh, we have a, a very strong uh, cooperation with the European Union and with the uh, United States and others. Uh, but one of the other questions that I would like to pose is, with the collect collective abilities of the United States, Western Europe, other intelligence agencies, are we really doing enough? 
and do we have all the information that we need and do we have the equipment for those who have suffered from terrorist activity that we need or are, is there still certain uh, apprehensions and restrictions that uh, don't enable us to fully undertake the job? We, we pay the price, but at least give us the resources so that we can do the job. In, in a second round, I'm going to ask you to, to, to turn to Director Coates and tell him what it specifically you want <laughs> <laughs> so he can get the ask. He, ha he has uh, a list. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me turn to uh, for Mr. Junawi of, of Tunisia. Um, Minister, Tunisia is the country where we like to say the Arab Spring succeeded. Uh, it's, it's a place where there was real change, a new constitution, a new feeling among Tunisians. And yet, for me, the paradox of Tunisia is that it's also been an extraordinary source of foreign fighters who've gone into ISIS, who, who were part of the, the most dangerous uh, part of the ISIS threat. And perhaps you could talk about where Tunisia is in dealing with this problem, both internally, what your feeling is about internal uh, stability, and then this really vexing problem of foreign fighters. Well, thank you very much. A uh, few days ago, uh, Kuwait hosted an important international conference about uh, the defeat of ISIS and the reconstruction of Iraq. It was a good occasion to uh, congratulate Iraq uh, about uh, its victory against terrorism, but, uh, and to focus on the reconstruction of that country. But are we today in a position to celebrate the defeat of ISIS. Uh, I think terrorists, they have been pushed away from uh, the, the land they have been holding in Iraq and Syria, but they are merely changing their address. Uh, they are uh, maybe will be changing in a few uh, time, uh, not uh, in a long time, uh, even their name. Uh, they are concentrated, they are uh, looking for hideouts, sanctuary in other places, particularly in which, uh, and this concern Tunisia, in Libya, in sub-Saharan Africa, and maybe in other parts of the world. So what happens in Iraq, I think it's uh, just a battle of a long uh, uh, war which we have to conduct against terrorism. Uh, and that war, to be won, I think, needs to be uh, uh, undertaken on three major fronts. First of all, we, it's a war, it's a battle of ideas. And it, this has been mentioned already. Uh, we have to eradicate that extremist ideology, which is, unfortunately, uh, trying to lure young people and enroll them uh, for different reasons, and I'll come back to Tunisia later, uh, enroll them in these extremist groups. We have to reform education, our education system. We have to promote tolerance, the idea. And when I say promote tolerance, acceptance of the other, I'm not talking just about the Arab world. It happens also in Europe, because we feel that there are new trends for xenophobism. Uh, rejection of the other. This morning, I've been here in this room listening to prominent speakers talking about how to reinforce the foreign border of Europe and develop mobility within Europe. We are living in a global age where uh, you cannot uh, build fortress. It's a matter of connection, and people are connected through the internet and through other means. Uh, the second, uh, I think, battle which we have to win is a battle of development. You cannot today have uh, in this globalized world uh, uh, prosperous countries living just a few hundred kilometers from very poor countries. And we found out in Tunis, in Tunisia, that many of those been, uh, young people who have been enrolled in these uh, hotspots they were lured basically for economic reasons, because they didn't have opportunities. They were looking for opportunities. They have uh, uh, university degrees, 
but unfortunately the Tunisian, the national economy was not able to absorb them. So they have been attracted by these groups and these, terror, uh, these criminals and enrolled in, uh, uh, in the fight in Syria and in Iraq. The third uh, battle, I think, which we have to work together to win is international cooperation. Now it's obvious that there is no country in the world which is immune of terrorism. And no country in the world, regardless of its might, its resources, is able to win this battle against terrorism. This requires international cooperation. And when I say international cooperation, of course, it, this requires sharing of intelligence, sharing, but also uh, empowering uh, the countries which uh, are in the front forefront of the battle against terrorism. When we uh, had to defeat ISIS in Ben Gardin, in south of Tunisia, of course we did this for the Tunisian uh, security, but also we were there, we did that, and uh, I think it was on the benefit, for the benefit also of our partners in, other, in, uh, in Europe. So this is a common battle, this is a common war, we have to win it together. And what is happening now, we don't feel, frankly, that that cooperation is as close as we wish it. So we need more cooperation, more interaction between our two country, uh, our countries, uh, South, uh, I mean the South uh, countries, uh, South Mediterranean country, but also with Europe. Now, coming back to Tunis, of course, uh, unfortunately, Tunis is in Tunisia today, we are trying to build, uh, we are a nascent democracy. We are to build, uh, trying to build a 21st century system, democratic system, which is exactly in the opposite of what these people trying to pull back, to, uh, to pull us back. Uh, they are trying to pull us back to the seventh, seventh century. So it's, it's exactly the opposite of their, uh, the, uh, the, their idea, of the society, of the uh, political system, and that's why they are targeting Tunisia. Tunisia has never been, we have never been prepared to fight terrorism, frankly speaking. For 60 years, we invested in education, women, uh, gender equality, women liberation, and social affairs. We never invested in our army. We thought that no, we never, will be never uh, in a position to uh, meet, you know, threats from our own people. But unfortunately, we found out that now we have to mobilize resources uh, uh, in order to, to uh, meet this new challenge. We cannot do it by, uh, we are doing it, but we cannot succeed in a short period of time by ourselves. Uh, what Tunisia is trying to build in, uh, in, in the South Mediterranean area is uh, an experience which, uh, if, succeed, if it succeeds, this is going to have its impact on the whole region. Uh, the cost of supporting Tunisia, winning, what, uh, what we are trying to, to achieve is much, much less than the cost if we, God forbids, we fail in achieving a full-fledged democratic system. Thank you, uh, Minister. I just would note that I think each one of our speakers so far has mentioned at some point the importance of greater cooperation, greater sharing of intelligence. Uh, it's a, a, a clear, common uh, theme. So let me turn now to General uh, Manguno from Nigeria. Uh, General, wh when I ask uh, U.S. Uh, military and uh, security officials uh, what front in this fight uh, against jihadism after the caliphate they think is getting uh, too little attention. They almost always answer uh, uh, North Africa and Central Africa. In other words, you, the, the, the front that you know best. So I think there's a particular interest in understanding how you're doing in Nigeria and dealing with Boko Haram, how you're deal dealing with the uh, spread of, of, of people moving out of Nigeria north uh, and the danger of that. Give us, give us a, a report on how things are going. First of all, I'd like to just make a little clarification 
on um, the battle of narratives and um, in terms of the words jihadism and caliphate. Now, majority of Muslims all over the world, 1.6 billion Muslims making about 24% of the world's uh, population don't really see jihadism and caliphate, the two terms, in the way academics and policymakers tend to cling on to those terms. For Muslims, especially I can speak for Sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria, we tend to believe that what the jihadist, the violent extremist, sees as um, jihadism is a different concept for us because we tend to see it as striving for good and not using violence to destroy other societies and so on and so forth. And in a similar vein also, the term caliphate, the notion of a caliphate, that utopia as um, seen by the jihadists is not really how the general uh, population of Muslims see it, especially in Africa. Um, that is why a lot of Muslims tend to gravitate towards other developed societies which offer them an environment, a climate in which they can pursue whatever legitimate undertakings they want to pursue. Now, going back to our situation in Nigeria, prior to 2001, most of sub-Saharan Africa did not have issues with foreign terrorist organizations. It was an unknown phenomena. And um, what basically happened was factors, structural factors affecting governance began to give way to tendencies for outside forces to come in lack of transparency, corruption, weak political leadership, poverty, hopelessness, and so on and so forth, created an environment which made terrorists to capitalize and seek uh, ways of influencing those societies in a very negative way. For Nigeria, fortunately, our own association has not really been with entities like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and ICIM. Basically, Boko Haram is a homegrown terrorist organization which has had its recruitment base from the northeastern part of Nigeria, where I happen to come from. But at the same time, with the continued uh, fight against normal society and no norms, these terrorists have been able to penetrate countries in the Lake Chad region, Niger, Cameroon, and um, Chad. Now, what we are beginning to see is that with the fall of the caliphate, two things will happen. First, the large number of foreign terrorist fighters will want to gravitate towards other parts of the world, especially the Middle East, and then there will be a southward movement towards sub-Saharan Africa. And the most probable location will be Nigeria, which has the largest population and the largest economy facing several other challenges, including you know, piracy, maritime issues, and uh, other domestic conflicts. What the government of President Buhari has done in combating this uh, issue is, first of all, to develop a national counter-terrorist strategy, which basically looks at forestalling, securing, and identifying issues that tend to bring or 
add to whatever problems we have. For stalling, that is um, the countering, preventing and countering violent extremism program, uh, securing our borders and not giving room for foreign jihadists to come into the country and identifying individuals and groups whose activities, deeds or misdeeds have the potentials of encouraging terrorism. Nigeria has also embarked on greater collaboration, bilateral, regional and international collaboration with its neighbors in the West African sub-region. <coughs> Two things we've done. First of all, the multinational joint task force, which is the physical presence of troops in that general area to deal with the physical issues of uh, fighting terrorism. And secondly, we have the Regional Intelligence Fusion Unit. That's a, a kind of cooperation between the countries in West Africa and also our major partners, the United States, Great Britain, and France. Apart from that, we've also tried to enhance the capabilities of the armed forces and make them more effective in dealing with terrorists. Again, we've also looked at cybersecurity, trying to improve the cybersecurity and Nigeria trying to dominate its own cyberspace and uh, fighting terrorists. We've also tried to enhance the capabilities of our financial crime fighting institutions like the EFCC and the National Financial Intelligence Unit. Again, we've also tried to work on issues of good governance. Now, basically what has tended to happen is that because of structural issues, poverty, bad governance, illiteracy, and so on and so forth, there is a general pull, an attraction towards countries like Nigeria. And the only way in which we can counter this thing is by improving on governance, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level. And that is what we're working on as espoused by the philosophy of good governance of uh, President Buhari. So basically, in a nutshell, that's what Nigeria has been doing. Again, the other issue we're faced with is the potentials for the continuation of this jihad online as a virtual caliphate, which will then begin to inspire aspiring jihadists, young men and women. And because of that, we have to work in collaboration with other countries, not just in Africa, but in the entire international community. Thank you, uh, General. Let me t turn finally to uh, Sir, Sir Julian King, who is the top security official for the EU. Uh, and I, I want to ask you first um, about what your visibility is uh, into the people who are fleeing the collapsing uh, caliphate. Do you see, see the move? Are you able to operate uh, effectively? And second, I want to just read you uh, something that um, Theresa May said this morning, which I think is very much uh, uh, on target. She said, nothing must get in the way of Britain and the EU helping each other in every hour of every day to keep our people safe. And that obviously goes to the question of post-Brexit, Britain has been a key uh, resource for intelligence and other CT skills for, for the EU, what happens to that? Um, so maybe you could just address how the world looks uh, to you from your vantage with, with those particular uh, issues. You know he's British. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. I don't know whether he's gonna, gonna, gonna go away and leave his job or... or well, that bit, I, that bit I can give you a definitive answer to. <laughs> uh, uh, we're expecting the UK to, to leave in March 2019. I think um, Prime Minister May uh, was pretty clear about that this morning, um, and I leave my job at that point. But that still, that still leaves some time to uh, continue the work that we've been doing uh, on this whole range of, of issues. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to do that right up until 
uh, the last hour of the last day. Uh, now, you, you ask about the picture. Uh, well, the first thing I want to say is that um, I think you've, you've got a very strong shared picture from the various different panelists that we've just heard. Uh, the uh, amazingly good work that's been done to, to break up the so-called caliphate on the ground doesn't mean the end of this problem. Uh, it, it has dispersed. It's dispersed physically, uh, and we've heard different um, accounts of that. And because it's an ide ideology, uh, it's also um, dispersed, continued to uh, spread uh, its messages of incitement to, uh, to hatred and incitement to, to violence uh, through various means, also online. Uh, there's some talk about a, a virtual a virtual caliphate. Uh, I think the, the jury's still out on exactly how much material um, they're able to put up online at the moment, uh, but it is too much. Uh, it is still having an effect uh, uh, in our countries and in Europe. Uh, it is still radicalizing uh, susceptible, often young people. Uh, the attacks, as, as Thomas said, the attacks in Europe last year uh, were, were self-radicalized individuals, uh, many of them uh, with a track record of, of interacting with uh, ISIS propaganda uh, online, uh, which is why it's very important that we continue our efforts uh, to work with the platforms to identify and remove that content. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about right. that if you like. Uh, there is, there is a, a physical challenge, and we're acutely aware of the physical challenge. Uh, we're acutely alert of the risk uh, in Europe, uh, as in uh, other countries, of returning terrorist fighters. There haven't been very many recently. Uh, there, was a, there was a wave of returnees um, two or three years ago, but it has abated. There are various uh, uh, hypotheses about why that might be. Uh, one of them is that if you, if you didn't come back uh, at that point, it was because you were particularly motivated. And those particularly motivated individuals stayed in the region uh, to pursue what they considered to be their struggle, uh, to fight, some of them uh, to die. Uh, and uh, those that are still left uh, remain highly motivated and are uh, more likely to seek to move somewhere else to try and continue what they regard as their struggle. Uh, so it is very important that we do try and pull information about, about movements, uh, which, which we do try and do. Uh, and it is very important that we have a shared interest uh, working with uh, a range of partners who are also suffering the fallout of that dispersal of returning foreign terrorist fighters. So at the, at the time of the really catastrophic attacks in Belgium, it was widely said that the EU had a problem in not adequately sharing intelligence. And I, I wonder if you would just briefly say how you think that problem is, has gone. Is it significantly improved? And, and second, you get to wear your future hat. Is Britain, post-Brexit, going to share intelligence with the EU to the same extent it does now? Well, there's been a significant improvement in info information sharing and intelligence cooperation uh, across Europe which isn't to say that there aren't still issues. I'm not going to pretend that there aren't still issues. Uh, but as Thomas said, um, we have uh, increased uh, the, the controls that we have at our external borders. It's not necessarily about closing the borders. It's about having a much richer information picture about who is coming in and out of our shared space. And we have significantly increased the exchange of information between uh, different services, police, uh, border guards, immigration officers, uh, and intelligence services behind our, our borders. Again, you can't promise that there won't be some gaps, but there has been a significant increase in the amount of information, you can, you can, you can measure that, that is being shared across the network of EU-wide databases that, that we are building, have built, and are building. Uh, it went up 40% uh, year on year, 16 to 15 to 16, and we're expecting uh, an equivalent growth 16 to 17. And that's, uh, that's because everybody sees the need to share, given the scale of the threat and the nature of the threat. Uh, now, it's sometimes said that, that there isn't intelligence sharing in Europe. It's, it, it's just not true. 
uh, that there is, in fact, a uh, headquarters uh, where European intelligence services, all the European intelligence services, sit together uh, and work on a daily basis to share information. It's, it's been set up outside the framework of the, of the EU treaties because the EU treaties uh, put out certain constraints around that. But, but it exists, and it is doing very good work. And we are boosting the, the contacts, the working contacts between that community and the law enforcement communities. So the short answer is things have improved. Now, Brexit, I'm not trying to duck your question. Uh, the, um, uh, we'll have to see what happens in the process of negotiations. Um, uh, Michel Barnier, who's been at this conference, uh, is leading those negotiations for uh, the EU27. Uh, I thought that uh, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister May, set out quite clearly uh, this morning uh, the level of ambition from the UK side. Uh, and she uh, restated uh, that uh, for the UK, cooperation in this field was unconditional. Now, from the EU27 side, we have also said on a number of occasions that cooperation in, in this field should be unconditional. We'll have to see what that means as we work through the negotiating process, but what I think it means is that whatever else is happening in other areas of the Brexit process, on the economy and economic links, this part of the future partnership, there is a clear shared self-interest in continuing to find the most effective ways possible to combat these common threads. May I just add the... Sir. To share information within Europe is not only a question of political will. There are also technical and legal barriers. And we are working hardly uh, to overcome this uh, type of barriers. And this is all about in what we call interoperability. For example, Eurodac uh, for migrants, there we collect fingerprints, not names. Uh, within the Schengen information system, we collect names, but not fingerprints. You, you could say, well, bring it together. But this is technically quite complicated. It's a quite complicated IT project. And legally, there are some people in, within Europe who say it's not good to combine all this information. So this has to be done, and We're Julian doing is doing an excellent work there. Uh, so interoperability is not only a question of political will, but to find ways to combine the information we already have. This was, as everyone knows, after 9-11, the yeah. injunction, connect the dots. And that's Director Coates' job. So we have fi about 15 minutes left, and I'm going to go to the audience um, for questions. I just want to steal two minutes before we do that, um, and then I'll come back to you, um, to ask Director Coates a question. Um, we're privileged to have him here, and I would feel remiss if I didn't ask you on the day after uh, the Justice Department issued indictments of 13 Russians and, and organizations, if I didn't ask you as America's chief intelligence officer to just share with this audience your sense, as you know more and more as these indictments and other things come forward, about the nature of the threat that was put to the United States in 2016, and just sum it up for this audience. The uh, assessment uh, that was made public uh, more than a year ago before I took this job was that uh, the Russians had attempted to influence our presidential election process. Everything that has, that has happened since in terms of gathering information, collecting in, in, intelligence, um, has verified that assessment. The indictment of 13 Russians just this week, a few days, a day or so ago, uh, is a culmination of a gathering of mass amount of facts, things that actually supported that assessment. Uh, we've also learned that many of the countries represented here um, have acknowledged and faced the same type of attempts at influencing elections throughout a number of European countries and others. I'm amazed that um, having come to, to, to this uh, back when it was Verkunda and now MSC, uh, many, many times, uh, numerous uh, attempts. 
uh, to be here because uh, I think it's, it's an important place to be, uh, that the Russians come, send someone every year to basically refute the facts. Take this as a stage. It's almost automatic. They will come regardless of who they send, including their foreign minister's proclamation today denying the facts. Um, there's a statement on the wall of the Central Intelligence Agency and it says, ye shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I'd love to hear this. <laughs> the Russians come and uh, acknowledge that language. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Director. So uh, let's go to the audience for questions. Please identify yourself if you have a question for a particular panelist. Um, please uh, specify that. Yes, please. And if we could bring, if we have a microphone runner, yes. Uh, thank you, David. I appreciate the panelists' uh, interventions, but I was quite concerned by two panelists who said uh, eradicating terrorism is going to take time. The reason I say this is two things. One is that we need to really work together in a much more collaborative way before, God forbid, the terrorists work in a collaborative way. Technology is advancing so fast that if they start using it, it's going to make your job much more difficult. Now, there are two things that are undergoing right now that we can try and erad eradicate the collaboration of terrorists using cryptocurrency and the deep web. And I see no effort, and my question goes to Director Coates, really, with the United States technology capability. The deep web and cryptocurrency can, unfortunately, resist many of the efforts of collaboration between countries like yourselves and organizations such as the EU. And unless we find ways that we can work together to eradicate that, that they use it, we find ourselves at a disadvantage, in my view, and I'd like to hear comments on that. Let me uh, collect, since the time is short, a few more questions. The gentleman here in the first row, and then um, the, the, the woman here. Yes, yes, please. And we'll, we'll, we'll take those three and then come back to the panel. And when there was a hand all the way back there, maybe yes. We'll come to you, too. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed Abu Ghid, the Secretary General of the League of Arab States. I have noticed for a while now the misuse of the, of the title jihadi jihadism. It's as uh, mentioned by Samah Shukri or the Nigerian general or even the chief of, uh, of staff of the Pakistani army. The proper word, I think, is takfiri or takfirism. Why is it so? And that is the description that the Egyptian army uses against them. Why is it so? Because jihadi or jihadism is a description for someone who is making service to God and he is seeking to go to heavens after his death through the process of jihadism. He is actually a criminal. So my advice, and I have noticed this taking place and happening and uh, being talked about in many, many forums. My advice is the name should be takfiri or takfirism. Then the message is, is, uh, is there for the people and for our nations. <clears throat> Muslims consider jihad a holy endeavor. Takfiri is something that you go to hell. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Minister. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, thanks. Uh, Heike Hensel, member of the German Parliament, Bundestag. I would like to address Minister de Maizière, and I prefer to speak in German to address him. Um, Herr Minister. Minister, you talked about prevention, and I'm grateful for that. I think one important step or element of prevention is the question 
whether countries who are proven to support terrorist groups, whether I sent them arms. And it was a request by your own ministry to recognize that Turkey has become a sort of a platform for terrorist groups in the region. So my question is, which consequences stem from this? Which uh, measures do you take against vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey and also Saudi Arabia? I think that's an important area. Maybe you can comment on that. All the way in the back, the woman just in front of the TV camera. I get up so you can see me. My name is Florence Gaub. I work for the EU Institute for Security Studies, which is an EU agency. Uh, one of our jobs is to inform decision makers with uh, academic insight. And what troubled me about your panel today was that you talked a lot about ideology, poverty, education, but academia, science proves that these are actually not the main ingredients when it comes to the creation of terrorism. There's a clear correlation between terrorism and state repression in non-G8 states, and in G8 states, it's a correlation with lack of integration. Could you please address how you intend to address both these issues, depending on where you're sitting? Thank you. Good. So let's um, ask our panelists to, to respond um, uh, briefly, because we're, we're close to the end of our session. Let's uh, start here with, uh, with Julian King and then move uh, the other way. We'll do this, as we say, a lightning round. Um, the uh, questions, the number of them, can we wait on dealing with these uh, problems? Uh, what about stopping using the word jihadism? Um, what about uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia's platforms? And what's the real causal factor? Uh, Julian King, start us off. Uh, well, I'll go with the first and the last of those. No, we can't uh, wait on dealing with this problem. And I don't think you've heard anything that suggests that we are waiting on dealing with this problem. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, there are elements of um, uh, social division that can feed into uh, the feelings that might make someone susceptible to being radicalized and going down the route of violence. But uh, there are also a lot of people uh, who don't go down that route. So I don't think it can be the complete explanation of the problem that we've got. General Manguno. Well, basically, for us in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, the shrinking of space or loss of physical territory doesn't really mean an end to violence. For as long as we have societies and uh, territories that are afflicted by bad governance, illiteracy, poverty, hopelessness, and desperation, there will be some kind of pull towards such societies because of the inherent vulnerabilities. So we don't see an end to this. It's a two-way thing. Developing societies have to take one or two steps towards developed societies, and we need to confront this devil together. Minister Janawi. No, no comment. All right, uh, Minister Shukri. Just to comment on the cause, and, and certainly there is the uh, attraction and, and the more susceptible segments uh, that can be lured and enticed to uh, terrorism, but it is still an ideology, and uh, despite everything else, it is a political movement, as we saw in the ISIS, ISIS was, its objective was to create a state, and a state is a political entity. So there is a political motivation, enticement through various means of radicalization, but, it, but that enticement is primarily on an ideological basis, and it is the narrative that we have to address. Director Coates. Uh, well, quickly, I think a, a deep state in the, uh, ultimately, um, the public, um, needs to, uh, we, we need to be transparent uh, in terms of what we're doing to the extent that we can without compromising our capabilities and compromising uh, our assessments. Um, but uh, in the end, uh, we found that uh, when put, uh, there, there is a balance between the need for privacy uh, of our citizens, but also security. Sometimes the pendulum goes too far than another, so we need to find that balance. But frankly, when it comes down to it, what I have found, and I think what we have determined, is that in the end, uh, most citizens uh, are willing to compromise a bit of privacy if they know that we are providing measures to keep them safe. 
Regarding words, I think messaging is very important. Um, different cultures assign different types of messages and words in terms of how they describe what's going on. Uh, it's violent extremists, extremists, uh, jihad, uh, uh, radical Islam, and so forth. I do think we need to be careful how, if we're communicating to another culture in a different language, uh, the words that we think are most appropriate don't necessarily come to the ears and brain of those that we're trying to reach in the way we think that it does. Um, thirdly, uh, with that transparency, we, that's why we have unclassified sessions. It's, we have to be careful we don't uh, slip into the, to the classified, but we try to make that transparent to our people. And the real cause, I think there are multiple things. I talked about theology, I talked about ideology, but of course there are young men sitting on the corners of streets with nowhere to go, um, uh, and they see this as an adventure and they're going to go there. The others are lured by the thought of, um, I can do something important, I'm not doing anything important now. So I think there are multiple causes. We can't just label it to one uh, cause for uh, what we're seeing uh, transpiring across the globe. Minister de Maziere, last, last word. Zunächst zur Sprache. Ich teile die auf. Well, first on the terminology, I share the view that we have to be careful when it comes to the words, the terms. When we talk about the Islamic State, for example, then we accept the statehood nature of this murderous gang. So I always like to talk about the so-called Islamic start. And also, jihad, we heard, is not the correct term to be used. On the other hand, language is used in a different way. Maybe it's easier to just call them terrorists and murderers. That is the most precise term for these people. On arms exports, well, if the world were as simple as that, partners that we cooperate very closely with, Egypt and Tunisia, want to exchange more data with us on possible equipment, I can only answer them. German courts and uh, uh, German opposition tells us that their level of protection, data protection, is not as high as ours, so we cannot exchange data. And then my counterparts uh, tell me, but this somehow limits our joint fight against terrorism. So this is not a black and white picture, but we have to find a way to solve this problem. As far as the arms exports are concerned, of course, NATO is and remains an important NATO partner and is also only natural and goes without saying, uh, apart from a lot of things that I would like to criticize when it comes to uh, Mr. Yildirim's speech, but we must also understand that Turkey has uh, s suffered much more um, in, from terrorism and they had much more uh, victims. So um, they are an important part a partner. So is Saudi Arabia. And I received very valuable uh, information from Saudi Arabia about a possible Islamist attack during my first tenure. Um, so this does not necessarily lead us to arms export. You are correct. But to believe that the world will be a safer place if we leave our partners in the fight against terrorism alone, well, I'm not convinced that this is good. On the lady at the back, if academics say it is uh, already proven that the facts are such and such, well, it's not quite as easy. It's not just the lack of integration that is the main cause for terrorism. It may be one of the causes, but uh, we have many other causes. So the things are more complex. When I talk to those who work with people who uh, are radicalized or are on the verge of being radicalized. Do you know what I hear very often? Many young people are being radicalized because
because they have a problem with the figure of a father, a strong father, no father, a weak father, the, a lack of recognition. Very often they are uh, religious illiterates. They often do not know anything about Islam. So the problems are multifaceted, and this is why our responses need to be multifaceted as well. Again and again was cooperation and sharing information, and our panel has cooperated and shared information, so thank you very much. Well said yeah. at the end there. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was